uh, in Sunday school. Uh, Brother Elijah just taught the last couple of Sundays. And so uh, uh, this morning uh, we're going back to uh, the second coming and studying on that uh, second coming. And uh, we've gone through a large portion of that. Now, uh, I sent out this morning, uh, took me two tries to get it out right. Brother John helped me out this morning and said I didn't get the attachment in on the first time. So if you'd like to use your phone and follow the outline. Now I generally, you know, I discourage phone use during teaching because, you know, I'm afraid somebody's like on social media or something like that or the message is boring or whatever. But uh, if you want to do that, there should be an email uh, in that regarding that. I have some printed out copies of the outline back there on the little bulletin board uh, thing if anybody wants to get a printed out copy right there uh, to follow along and so uh, and we're going to come down uh, to uh, point number 12 this morning but let me kind of review since it's been a couple of few weeks uh, to talk about uh, where we have been what we have covered so far in regards to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And what we said, what we're going to cover first of all are those things that we know are very clear in the scriptures. As we've said, there's a lot of things that are veiled, so to speak. So a lot of, a lot of things that are uh, hotly discussed <laughs> regarding eschatology, which is the doctrine of the second coming. But there are a lot of things that are plainly known. And so this is the point of this, at least this first portion of the study regarding the second coming is we're talking about those things that are plainly revealed, that are plainly spoken of in the scriptures. So first of all, point number one was that the time was unknown. You have the scripture references there, I'm not going to go back through those, but that the time of it is unknown. And then number two, we talked about what is the second coming called. It's not, it's not always... It doesn't state the coming again of our Lord. And we talked about all of those little subtitles that are right there uh, under that about the different uh, things of which the second coming is called. Then we spoke about point number three, that the second coming is foretold. It's foretold you know, by the Old Testament prophets, by Jesus himself, by the apostles and the angels. Number four, the signs preceding or at the time of the return of Jesus Christ. That's point number four uh, in that. And the various scriptures that deal with that. Then we talked about the manner of. What is the manner of uh, the second coming of Christ? In the clouds, with power and great glory, with the shout, with his saints, with his angels. Suddenly visible and unexpectedly. Uh, number six, we talked about that the heavens and the earth will be dissolved. The destruction of this planet, uh, what we would call the old earth and the old heavens, the created heavens that we see around us, and then we'll have, of course, the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, we touched upon that. Number seven, we talked about that the dead in Christ will rise first uh, when the Lord comes again. Number eight, we talked about that those alive in Christ will be changed. They will be changed. Uh, number nine, there will be punishment for the lost, as we saw. Uh, we don't believe in annihilationism. We do believe that man has an eternal soul uh, and that there will be an accounting for whether we are righteous or unrighteous. Uh, the righteous will be revo rewarded. They will be changed into a glorious body. The unrighteous will be punished. Number ten, every eye shall see him what we spoke of with that in Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 and there's other passages that, that are not on the sheet that uh, I've since added to that Daniel 7 and 13 uh, Acts 1 10 and 11 Matthew 24 and 30 and Matthew 26 and 64 but every eye shall see the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns and then the last point that we finished several weeks ago what are the purposes of the second coming of Christ and then of course it's to complete the salvation of the saints uh, glorification namely uh, there will be judgment by the son that we talked about then 
Uh, there will be the reign of Christ that is spoken of in Revelation chapter 11 and 15 specifically and in those other passages there. And then all the enemies of Christ will be put down and that's spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26, 55 through 57. And uh, I added uh, one on there, Psalm 110 and verse 1. So that's what we covered up and through the last time that we taught. So what we're going to talk about today is the remaining points. We have three remaining points at least in the present uh, outline and there will be some more added to this. Uh, but number 12, it should, we, it should always, the second coming should always be considered at hand. Uh, and I don't know if you've heard of the doctrine or what we call the eminence or the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or we could say the impending uh, return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is like an unknown, unknown aspect. As we talked about the very first point was it's unknown, but also to bring in this idea that the coming of Christ could be at any time. Uh, now, there's been debate about this. Uh, could it have been imminent at the time of the Apostle Paul when he wrote his letters, or Peter, or John, because uh, there are those that say certain things had to happen first before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's a lot, of, a lot of debate there, but we do believe in the imminent or the impending return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we should always be ready. Uh, is, and we're going to, we might talk and touch upon that some. But to look at these passages that are revealed here, look first of all in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and 25, of course, we've referred to that a lot because this is a couple of chapters where Jesus talks about his coming again uh, in some, some detail here. But in chapter 24, in verses 42 through 44. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And so this is why I always say, stay away from date setters. <laughs> no one knows. Uh, no one knows when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return again. But there is, should be a readiness uh, in our hearts because we don't know. Uh, we do know he's coming, but we do not know at the specific time at which that he is coming. Another passage that we could look at uh, that I have marked down here or have here is in Luke's Gospel. In Luke's Gospel chapter 12, and there in verses 37 through 38, Luke's Gospel chapter 12, verses 37 through 38. And he says there, Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake. When he comes, truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. So again, there's this idea here of the readiness because we do not know the time because we believe that his time, his coming could be at any moment in time. Could be today. We don't know. Could be a thousand years from now. A thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years, the scripture says to the Lord. So we don't know uh, the answer to that in regards of uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. But certainly those of us, especially that are believers, are to be ready, no matter at what particular point in time uh, he comes again. And one other passage, you don't have to turn to this one, but I, and I, ha I have, don't have this one in the notes, but I do have it in my notes. 1 John chapter 2 and verse uh, 28. He says, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink or we could say not be ashamed of him in shame at his coming. Uh, so uh, it speaks here and really this speaks to readiness. This is what this is talking about. We're to always be prepared. And how do we be prepared? Well, it's, it has to do with faithfulness. Are we going to be found faithful when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again? Uh, you know, uh, 
that, and we should always live our lives day by day as if, as if the Lord, you know, when he comes, will find us being faithful to him so that we won't be ashamed when he comes again. Uh, there will be those, I'm sure, of his children when he comes again that are not being as faithful as they should be. They'll still be going to heaven, but will there be some aspect of shame when that occurs? But we are, there's a call to faithfulness uh, in view of the second coming of Christ. Uh, it would be sort of like if you had uh, a neighbor uh, show up at your house and your house was in terrible shape. I'll speak this, this is more to the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and and they show up and they walk in and your house is a wreck and you would feel shame at that. This is that's a maybe a poor example of that. But uh, at the same time, we are to be found faithful and not be ashamed uh, of our testimony or our witness as believers when He uh, returns again. So, uh, any questions or comments there regarding that uh, imminence or that impending return of Christ? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Are we living pure life? Yeah. Faithfulness, uh, sanctification. Are we living sanctified lives? You know, are we living holy lives? Uh, you know, the scripture says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Uh, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. <laughs> Uh, this is the will of God, your sanctification. <laughs> you know, all sorts of passages that have to do, and that goes along with the faithfulness aspect of it also. The faithfulness, the sanctification, uh, that all goes into the readiness for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, yes. Okay, so point number 13, relationship to the saints. What relationships to the saints, of course... Uh, does the second coming have? And of course, for us, uh, for believers, we have more concern or more anticipation, of course, of the second coming of Christ than unbelievers do. Unbelievers really don't have either an anticipation of it or they're not looking for it and they don't really want it. <laughs> they don't really want to see the second coming of Christ. Uh, there are two, as we've talked about somewhat, there are two aspects of the second coming of Christ. And we're going to talk here about relationship to saints is point number 13. And point number 14 is going to be the relationship really to the wicked regarding uh, the second coming of Christ. So look, if you would, first of all, here we are assured of the second coming of Christ, that we shall see Christ. And look back at Job 19. And verses 25 through 27. And, and it's always, this is interesting to talk about this statement by Job uh, in the scriptures. Now can anybody guess as to why that might be? It is the oldest book of the Bible. At least according to scholars that this was written before any other book of the Bible. Even before the Pentateuch, before the, the books of the law uh, there were written. Uh, and so we all know the story of Job and what he went through, and yet Job remained faithful. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But one of the things, even before that there really we find any prophecies concerning uh, Christ, at least Genesis speaks of that, and maybe by oral tradition Job knew of that. Uh, he must have, and that must have been revealed to him concerning the coming Messiah because he had this faith. He was a faithful man. We know that. He was a righteous man. God said there in Job chapter 1 that he was a righteous man. And, and he's gone through all of these things, lost everything, gone through per terrible physical and emotional uh, and I'm sure spiritual, what we would call pain and distress. But what do we find in verses 25 through 27 of Job 19? And he says, therefore, I know that my Redeemer lives. You know, we have that song. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And, he, and this is where this comes from. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been 
Thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. My heart faints within me. And I guess he's saying my heart faints within me at the thought of this, that one day in my flesh I will see the Redeemer. I will see God uh, personally in appearance. And that's a wonderful assurance for believers. And God gave this assurance to Job this far back. Uh, and then, but that just solidifies with us that all the, all the believers through all the ages, I believe, have had this hope and this assurance and this faith concerning the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's why that we have uh, the writer of Hebrews gave us, wrote Hebrews chapter 11, but while I call the honor roll of faith. All of these believers of that time who had been faithful, and we have the whole list there, were faithful in spite of the fact that Jesus Christ had not yet ever been born. But they had faith that he was going to be born, and he was going to redeem his people from their sins. And that, I mean, that's a wonderful thought. And so that shows that this faith that the Old Testament saints had is not really any different than what you and I have. The same kind of faith. Faith that is the gift of God. But anyway, and it would take that kind of faith to believe this for Job, we see in that. He had a good doctrinal stance. He had a good doctrinal stance back then. All right, secondly, what relationship it has to the saints is the saints... They look for, they love, and they are waiting for the second coming of Christ. Now this, as I've already made mention, is not so with unbelievers. And really 2 Thessalonians, I think, in chapter 2 there, and in verses 9 and 10, really kind of speaks to that. Uh, to that. And that's why I had this, this particular verse first here. But in verses 9 and 10 or 8, 9, and 10. Let me just read 8, 9, and 10. It says, And then the lawless one will be revealed who the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. And then therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And man, that's, mm, you know, so and he, that, that phrase pleasure in unrighteousness, that's, that's, that, think about that. Those that are in sin, and we, and we talk about this and in, in, in still even knowing the doctrine of total depravity and original sin, and those things. I am still sometimes bewildered that the pleasure that the world finds in sin, and they revel in sin. You see drunkenness, sexual immorality, pleasure in riches and power and those things, and they are not ashamed of any of those things, but more even boastful about those things. And so this scripture speaks to that. And those are going to be punished for that sin. They're going to be punished for that sin. This is what the scripture speaks to. And they're not looking, they're not even thinking, I don't think, of the second coming of Christ. They take pleasure in these things. And basically you know Romans chapter 1 where uh, the scripture speaks of, of God eventually gives those over who don't, do not like to retain him in their knowledge and he gives them over to what we call a reprobate mind. I'm not going to get off too much into the doctrine of reprobation, but he gives them over to that sin. To finally, fine, you don't want to believe the testimony that I've given of my handiwork in the heavens and perhaps any word that you might have heard concerning the gospel or Christ. I'm going to give you over to this and those are going to be punished for that sin. God is not going to be mocked. Uh, and so there is going to be coming a judgment. But they don't, they're not looking for, and they're not waiting for, and they do not love the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. But God's people do. <laughs> God's people do. And so the next passage there deals with that. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. And in that particular passage, uh, the Apostle Paul, of course we all know that this is uh, the ending of his life. This is the last letter that he wrote before his martyrdom. He writes here, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. There is a love. There is a desire for the second coming of Christ. Uh, and, it, and I wonder, you know, then sometimes in my mind, I try to wrap my mind about that. What is that going to be like? What is Jesus going to look like? You know, what is that appearance going to be like? Far beyond anything that we can think. But for all of us as that are believers, there's a love for Christ that means I want to be with Him. Uh, it's sort of like when husbands and wives, and, and, and there's that separation sometimes where maybe your jobs take you far away from your spouse or whatever like that or whatever like that. And there's that anticipation because of your love for that person to see them again. Well, we've never seen Jesus uh, literally, and there is that love, and there, I think there is that anticipation by believers for Christ to see him at this particular time. And, and the Apostle Paul in the very next book in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 talks about here about the blessed hope, waiting for our blessed hope. I like that translation, our blessed hope. Not the blessed hope of unbelievers, it is the blessed hope of believers. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. The appearance, the manifestation of the glory of our great... And it's, as we said, that glory uh, of Christ. It's, it's interesting. I was reading a book uh, just last evening and it talked about the, that inherently the glory of God. It's not anything... We don't, we don't make Him more glorious. Glory and holiness is part of His being. He just possesses that. And when He appears, we're going to see that. We're going to see that glory uh, when he comes again. And so that is the blessed hope of seeing and being in the presence of the holiness and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns again. That is something that believers have. And then the Apostle Peter, and we're going to talk a lot about Peter this morning in, in, the, in, the, in the message in the, in the morning worship, but the Apostle Peter wrote something concerning uh, the coming of Christ. And it's in 2 Peter chapter 3. And you might just keep your finger there because when we get to the next point, we're going to reference another scripture in this particular chapter. But in verse 13, uh, well, I mean, let me read from verse 11 because it kind of touches on something what we spoke of a while ago about, about the, the faithfulness thing. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? So Brother Wayne, Brother John, that speaks to that, what we were talking about a little while ago. Uh, and so waiting for and hastening the coming, there's the waiting, the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved. We've already spoken of that. The heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but according to his promise, we are waiting for again new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This is why we don't place, as believers, we should not place a lot of value in this world. We place some value in it because of the people that we love and, and that are close to us and, uh, and those things. But this is not where our value is. We're, 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 we're not, most of us, uh, tree huggers kind of a thing. Uh, I love God's creation, but we realize this is temporary. It's a temporary place. It declares the glory of God, but it's temporary. But we are looking for the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, as believers, we are kingdom of God minded. I hope you are. I, and so this is what we're looking for is the literal manifestation of the kingdom of God when Jesus returns again. It's according to his promise. We are waiting for that. The waiting of the coming of the day of God. The waiting for the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness will dwell. 
And that's a hard concept for now. I'll be honest, we, we went through Revelation on Wednesday nights. And, and, and the concept of living in a place and living in a, in a place of no sin, no temptation, uh, that's, hard to, that's hard for me to wrap my mind around. Because most of us, let's be honest, I'm sure we sin every day. And we confess those things. But to live in a place where that's not even a possibility, it's a wonderful thought to that. We won't have to battle that. We won't have to struggle about that. And so this is what believers have that they are, that they are loving, they are looking for, they are waiting for this coming of God, coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and this new heavens and the new earth. We anticipate that. Then he says to be patient, to wait for that. Well, a little farther up here in 2 Peter chapter 3, in verses 8 and 9, there were scoffers in that day concerning the coming of Christ, and there are still scoffers in this day and time. He says, but do not overlook this one fact. I like this, the one fact. Not, this is not, you know, a myth. Beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come or should reach repentance or come to repentance in that. I mean, there, there's a patience. We understand this may take a while. <laughs> it may not come. In our lifetime, I, I believe this. I believe that every generation since Jesus went back to be with the Father, I think every generation of believers has believed and anticipated the second coming of Christ. And really, that's as it ought to be, I think. I think it, that's as it ought to be. Uh, and I hear people say, well, certainly with all, everything that's going on in the world, this is, this is certainly the age. Could be. There's also been other generations before us that said the same thing. Uh, not, to, not to give away anything regarding well, the tribulation and all that kind of stuff, but there were people back during the Reformation time and prior to that that were undergoing intense persecution that believed this is the great tribulation. This is the tri time of tribulation. And so certainly Jesus is about to come back. And so in all of that, there's a patience. We need to be patient in waiting for the coming of, of Christ. Uh, back over a couple of uh, books ahead of this in James chapter 5 and verse 7 also speaks to this. He says, Be patient therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. Now, you know, some of y'all maybe you grow gardens or have grown gardens or have one. Uh, I could say this. I don't have the patience for it, I guess, or the desire. But, but, but a farmer doesn't, when he plants the seeds, like for corn or for tomatoes or, you know, whatever you plant or squash or whatever like that, he doesn't put the seed in there and say, well, okay, well, where are you? There's got to be patience. You know to wait for that fruit to come about, for that plant to grow and to give fruit. As believers, we're to be patient in the same way, to a greater extent perhaps, but we're to be patient. God has given His promise. We know that He's coming again. We just need to be patient about it. And so this is what, what James is speaking of there. Then uh, the next point is that we shall be preserved to the second coming of Christ. Saints shall be preserved to. And there's a lot of scriptures uh, here. I've added some. I have in here Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. He who has begun a good work in you uh, will keep you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, if you're still in James chapter 5, you can just basically go right across the page there in 1 Peter 1 and 5. Uh, and he talks here, Blessed be the God, beginning in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, 
undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, what does Peter say? He says, Paul said it in Philippians 1, and Peter says it in 1 Peter chapter 1, he's going to keep you. He is going to guard your salvation. Now, of course, we know that Jesus gave that same promise over, I would say specifically, we could look at John chapter 10, you know, about that you were in the Father's hand and no man can take you out of the Father's hand. You have eternal life. Uh, that is the promise that we will be preserved until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ or until we go home to be with the Lord. And there's other passages, of course, certainly Romans 8, 28 through 30 speaks to that because we know how in, in the tenses there, especially in verses 29 and 30 there in the past tense as God sees that accomplished in his mind. God doesn't see as we do in time. God sees in the eternal now and in his mind. That's an accomplished thing. When you're saved, when he, when you're saved, I mean, it's forever. It's eternal. He's preserved you. He is going to keep you. Uh, nothing shall separate you from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus in the latter part there, of course, of Romans chapter 8 uh, of that. So you're going to be kept in that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10. Jude, verse 24, all of that. Now, the next point in this is that as far as the relationship of saints to the second coming is that we shall not be ashamed of Christ at his coming. This kind of speaks somewhat to what we were talking about a little while ago about the readiness and the faithfulness that we will not be ashamed. So a couple of scriptures here. Uh, 1 John uh, chapter 2 and then verse 28. And that passed that verse there, now little children abide in him so that when he appears uh, we, may have, we may have confidence and not, not shrink from him in shame at his coming. In other words, again, uh, this confidence and uh, not this, being unashamed when he comes again. And then chapter 4 of this same book in chapter 4 and in verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. So there's no shame. We have confidence at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, the next point is blameless. Shall We shall be blameless. Now, what we are now is what we would say, I guess, theologically. God sees us as blameless, does he not? Do we know why that is? Because of Jesus, the shed blood of Christ. We are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. What we call justification, uh, the imputed righteousness of Christ. We are seen as righteous. Now, in our daily lives right now, are we still working through sanctification? <laughs> Absolutely. But when the Lord comes again, there's going to be, of course, as we know, the glorification, the transformation. But this is what we are to be striving for, is to be holy, to be blameless. This really kind of ties back in with what we've already, about, we've already talked about. And uh, we've, I've mentioned uh, Jude before, Jude uh, verse 24, it's just the one chapter. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. When we are presented to Christ, we are going to be blameless. Because 1 John 3 and 2 says when we see him, we shall be lacking for we shall see him as he is. So there's going to be a transformation and so there's going to be, we are going to appear blameless at that particular point in time in the manifestation of our glorified bodies at that particular point in time. Uh, a couple of other passages, these are found back over in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13 and then 5 and 23. And in chapter 3, in verse 13, But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be called... No, I'm in the wrong... I'm in Hebrews. Well, Hebrews is a good book, but that's not my passage I wanted. First Thessalonians, here we go. Chapter 3, verse 13. What does it say? So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. 
And then in 5 and 23, he speaks there as he says here, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So certainly those that have been declared righteous shall be presented in body blameless before the Lord uh, and to the Lord at his coming. Ephesians 1, what? 1, 4. Yeah, there's a lot, you know, uh, that could add it in there. That's right. All right, next, and this kind of speaks to this also, we shall be like him. Uh, there's a kind of a tie-in with these two points here together. Uh, I've, already, I've already quoted 1 John 3, 2, uh, when, we, when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There is that means we're going to be like Christ in the sense of being glorified. We're not going to be equal with Christ, but we're going to be like him in holiness. Uh, Romans 8 and 30 speaks to that, as we've already mentioned, when he talks about there that we will be glorified. That speaks to that also that we shall be like him. And then one uh, really additional passage in regards to that is Philippians uh, chapter 3, and there in verses 20. And uh, 21, uh, where Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Again, the wonder about what's that going to feel like, what's that going to be like, uh, there's nothing we can compare that emotion to in this life. Uh, you know, I've had some pretty good emotions, some pretty good emotional highs, you know, when I got married, when I had children, those kind of things, when I was saved, uh, you know, all of that, but uh, uh, there's nothing that's, good, that's compared to what that will be like, uh, you know, when we are transformed, when we see him as he is, and that's the next point in that, but those two tie in together also, we, we shall be like him, we shall see him as he is, when we see him as he is, we're going to be like him. Uh, if we, did, if we weren't transformed, we could not stand or be in his presence. Uh, I remember, I'm sure many of you know of the passage where, where the Lord spoke, where appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. And what did, what did Moses ask him? Moses asked him, well, let me see your glory. He didn't know what he was asking. <laughs> Let's be honest. He said, you can't, nobody, can, nobody can see me, Moses, and live but I'll put you in the, in the cleft of the rock and I'll pass by you and you'll see my goodness and my, and my mercy, but no man can see me and live. And so we will see Christ as he is in his glorified state when he returns again. Uh, then it says, The saints shall appear with him in glory. Uh, look at this, a couple of passages here that speaks of this. Colossians chapter 3. And verse 4, Colossians 3 and verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now the scripture speaks about when he returns that he is going to bring with him the souls of those that have already gone and to be with the Lord. Uh, and, and it says that there will be a bodily resurrection of those first, and then those that are alive and remain will be changed. Uh, now we know that there's some kind of appearance to those that have already gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, because you remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Peter and John knew, hey, there's Moses and Elijah over there. <laughs> there was some kind of appearance of them there. Uh, and so, and then we know from the, the, the book of Revelation that there's some kind of appearance of men. But there's going to be, as according to the scriptures, a bodily resurrection. Uh, you know, God's going to put all of those cells, I guess, back together. I don't know exactly how that's going to happen, but there's going to be a bodily form. And we're going to have a glorified body. Again, I don't know what we're going to look like. And I've talked about this many times before. Uh, am I going to look like, you know, young like I used to be? What, like, you know, the young guys over here? <laughs> I beg your pardon? Oh, I bet I'll be happy about it. He won't care. 
<laughs> I won't. I won't care what it looks like, what that body looks like. But I'll be. But uh, speculation. Sometimes speculate about that. But anyway, uh, you know, we, we will appear with him in glory. And there's a couple of other passages there that speak to that. Jude 14 and Revelation 19 and 14 also. Then it talks about crowns. So I, I've heard a lot of discussion about crowns. About you know, are these literal crowns or not? Uh, my speculation is that this is, you know, is it going to be a literal crown? I don't know. It could be. God desires that. Could it be symbolic? Certainly. Um, whatever crowns we get, it says we're going to cast them at the feet of Jesus, uh, as it speaks about in Revelation. But the scriptures speak to, to these crowns, and we've got the passages there to look at. 2 Timothy chapter 4 uh, and verse 8. And we've already read this one. Back when we were looking at, uh, when we talked about the waiting for and the anticipation of the second coming of Christ, it speaks there of a crown of righteousness. A crown of righteousness, which represents, as we talked about, the imputed righteousness of Christ that we possess. Uh, there's also uh, James chapter 1 and verse 12 uh, speaks of a crown. Uh, this one speaks of... Uh, that's, yeah, here we go. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. This speaks um, of, uh, of the eternal life that we possess as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, one more uh, where the scripture speaks to this is 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 14. Uh, Four, and four, excuse me, four. I've got a typo in there. It's verse four. First Peter, yeah. If, you, if you've got the printed out one, that's not verse 14. That's supposed to be verse four. Uh, it says there, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And so this speaks about the glory that we will possess in our glorified bodies in heaven. And then, uh, last point in regards to the saints, uh, it says that we shall reign with him. Uh, we do know, we've already read, that there's going to be new heavens and a new earth. We've already talked about that over there in the passage uh, in Peter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, and so there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. This is going to be dissolved. There's passages here. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, verses 18 and 20, uh, verse 27. But uh, for maybe a little quicker reference, uh, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10 speaks to this. Uh, where it says, You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Uh, so that tells us we're going to reign. Now, who are we reigning over? Uh, I'm not really sure are we going to be reigning over others. We're not going to reign over other believers, I don't think. Uh, but the new earth, uh, perhaps it's speaking there. You remember where Adam and Eve, when they were put in the garden, they were put there to tend for it, to subdue it. Is there going to be some sense in which we as believers reign over and subdue uh, the, the new earth? Uh, that may perhaps be speaking to that. But it does definitely say that we will reign with him. There's other passages there. Chapter 20 of Revelation, verses 4 and 6, and chapter 22 and verse 5 also. Now last of all, the last point of this is what relationship does the second coming of Christ have to the wicked. We've already kind of looked at this before uh, in the passage that they have pleasure in righteousness, so they, they scoff at the idea of a second coming. Uh, but in 2 Peter chapter 3, and we've read a couple of passages from this already, but chapter 3 and verse 3 of 2 Peter 3 says, Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Men, as we've already said, we've already made this point, scoff at the idea of the second coming of Christ. Uh, and the scripture speaks to them that they do not like to retain God in their knowledge. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't find people in my dealings out in the world that are not believers, they don't really want to talk about God. And they certainly don't want to talk about the second coming of Christ and judgment, whether they're going to be judged or not. They scoff at it. 
or they just don't want to talk about it because they don't like the idea of that. They are enjoying their, their sin. They're enjoying their pleasure. They're enjoying their wickedness. And so they scoff at this idea of the second coming of Christ. And yet for us as believers, we know this is very real, that that will come. Just as all of the other prophecies in the scriptures in the Old Testament have been fulfilled concerning the first advent of Christ, hundreds of them, the, the promises and the prophecies given concerning when Christ comes again in glory for the new heavens and new earth, those will be fulfilled. And again, we don't know what time frame that will be, uh, you know. Uh, it took personally for me. I, I believe that this is a young Earth, uh, and so if you take the young Earth theory, uh, that took about four thousand years from the time of Genesis three fifteen or so, somewhere in that time frame, until Jesus was born. And there were many prophecies. You think about all of the prophecies down through the time concerning that. Uh, and, but God fulfilled that in his timing and in his purpose. Uh, will it be another, if we had the same mindset, will it be another 2,000 years before the Lord comes back? We don't have any idea. But we should still have that same faith of the Old Testament saints that to know that that is going to be fulfilled and not join along with the scoffers uh, regarding that. Now, another thing that we are told is that the wicked will be surprised at the second coming of Christ. Certainly if they're not looking for it, uh, they will be surprised at it. Matthew chapter 24. Uh, as I said, this is one of the chapters where Jesus taught a lot about his second coming. And here in verses 37 through 39. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now that's an interesting passion, is it not? Uh, here was Noah, been building this ark for all of this, this century and over. And they're all thinking, oh, that, there's that crazy dude, Noah. Hey, look at that, he went in there and... And the door shut. Oh, well, let's go. we got a wedding to go to today. Guess what came? The flood came. The flood came. And the day when Christ comes again, it's going to be, Jesus said, in the same way, there's going to be marrying going on. There's going to be children being born. There's going to be all sorts of family things going on. Just like people think life is normal, this is going to go on ad infinitum, but it is not. It's not going to be like that. But people will be doing those kind of things. You go farther down in that particular chapter, in verses 48 through 51, uh, again, but if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just a picture of what awaits those that scoff at the second coming of Christ. And then, of course, in uh, the third point there, they shall be punished. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it speaks of the second coming of Christ. It says there there's two aspects to that. When he comes to be glorified in his saints, it says that. But also there's another aspect concerning the second coming of Christ there, and that is the punishment of those that do not know God. In verses 8 and 9, um, it says, In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints. I'm going to stop right there, but there's going to be a day of punishment. There's going to be a day of punishment for those that have don't have not been obedient to the gospel. There's going to be many people that have heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in one way or another and scoffed at it and refused it. They're going to be punished is what uh, the Lord says here, what Paul writes here. Uh, and that's a, that's a terrifying thing to think about. Not only the punishment of, of suffering in hell, 
but also eternity without God. There will be an eternity without God. No, no many second chances, so to speak. There's no second chances in regards to that. And that's a sobering thing to think about. And then the last point that we have here is that the man of sin will be destroyed and the beast and the devil uh, in all of that. There's many passages. I'm uh, going to look at a couple here that regards to that in regards to that a little farther over in 2 Thessalonians, this time in chapter 2 uh, and verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. And that man is going, and then you go down to verses 8 and 12, and it speaks there about his destruction. And we've already read through this, this particular passage of Scripture where it talks about the lawless and will be revealed, and then he's going to, it says the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing at his coming. And it's got to come before Christ. That, yeah, there had to be some, that man of sin had to come before Christ. Christ, there has to come before Christ comes again. Uh, has he been revealed in our day? I, I've heard throughout my lifetime, I've heard a lot of theories about who the man of sin was. Uh, I can remember many decades, ago, or several decades ago, not many decades, but several decades ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got to be careful about that. Uh, about theories about you know different political figures would show up in history. And, uh, oh, this is, this is, you know, a president or a king or a pope or whatever like that. This is him. This is him. So certainly Christ is coming again. Uh, and it wasn't them, you know. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, yeah, most likely about 99.9% .9 certain that, that, we're, that they were not, that we're not right. He will be known. He will be known, and then we can know if we're if we're around. If if he if he's revealed, undoubtedly, and we're around, we'll know. Okay, <laughs> the Lord's coming again soon. Yeah, and then in uh, basically, if you go to Revelation twenty, and verse ten. Uh, speaks of that the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so final destruction there. And there's other scriptures with that. Any any comments or questions? That went a little longer than I, but I wanted to get through with this today. I like the fact that we're kept because I certainly can't keep myself. That's, you know... We can't keep ourselves, but God keeps us. And that's, that is very reassuring, <laughs> very reassuring. All right, well, let's dismiss in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise, the promises <laughs> concerning your second coming and the promise that we are kept, we are preserved, and that certainly we will be one day as you are. We will see you as you are and we shall have those glorified bodies that you have said we will have. Father, may we be as your children encouraged by these things and Father, may we also uh, be much about the business of proclaiming your gospel so that those that are still outside of Christ might hear the word of God. We know that you use your word in the salvation of sinners. We pray even today, Lord that your word would, would touch the hearts and the lives of people and they would be awakened to their sin if they did not know you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.